Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And we, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. You know, we've only been given this day, so let's make it count. And we only have today. We don't know what tomorrow may bring, but let's just make sure everything's good with us and the Lord today. Hallelujah. And just before I just start into this topic, I just had a scripture come to me. It's in Joel. So I'm just opening my King James Bible to Joel chapter, chapter 2. And it's just the first scripture here in Joel chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Hallelujah. Blow the trumpet. What's the trumpet? It's the word of God. And the day of the Lord is at hand. And God's word is being blown throughout every nation. Hallelujah. It's for his glory. And he's doing it in the earth through his ministries. And we need to have hearts that are soft and open that the Lord can write his word upon our hearts because that day is coming and it's coming right on time. And none of us know when our last day will be. None of us know when we will take our last breath. But even so, we have today. And so today, let's make sure we're all in a place where we are serving God, loving God and turning to him. And in fact, today, that's what I'd like to talk about. It's a, it's a topic I've called turn again to the Lord, turn again to the Lord. And if we open our Bibles to Malachi, that's the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter three, it's verse six. It says, for I am the Lord, I change not. I am the Lord, I change not. And God is not changed and neither has his desire and plan for mankind. And God has always desired to dwell with a people that love him and serve him. Hallelujah. And you know, God did not make mankind to be a robot. God gave us all free choices. However, with a free choice comes responsibility and consequences. And to turn again is similar to repent. You're going in one direction and then you turn and you go in a different direction and it's the direction should be always towards the Lord. And so to turn again to the Lord means at some stage a person has turned away from the Lord. And turning away from the Lord is a heart condition. And the children of Israel, they're an example to us, God's church. And many scriptures reveal their heart and their choices. And what does, what does God's word say about the heart of man? Let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. And we read here and it says, The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And the Amplified says, the heart is deceitful above all things and is exceedingly perverse and corrupt and severely mortally sick. Who can know it? Perceive, understand, be acquainted with his own heart and mind. The only one who knows our heart is the Lord. And because he looks on the heart and not on the outside. And I'll read it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his appearance or at the height of his stature. And he was referring to David at the time. For I, for, sorry, for others at the time. But I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. You know, when Jesse brought all his sons before him, some looked tall, some looked good looking, some looked this, some looked that. But God said, he had a man and it was because of his heart. And so God looks onto the heart. It doesn't matter what we are on the outside, how we look. We all look different. That's just the uniqueness of us and how God made it to be. But more importantly, God looks on our heart. And so because God looks on our heart, he weighs every heart, every motive and every action. And even so, we know from scripture that God is very merciful and he's always reaching out to his people, desiring them to obey him. 
And how do we know this? By reading all scripture. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 going to bring something out here today. Second Corinthians, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And we know that all scripture is both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that word profitable means it's to our advantage. So understanding all scripture is to, so all scripture, Old and New Testaments, is to our advantage. And the Amplified says, every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, which is holy living in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose and action. Hallelujah. And so we read here the benefits, some of the benefits of every scripture. They are for the correction of error, the discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness. That's God's right ways. And, you know, God's words are alive and powerful. And when we hear it with our spiritual ears, it will bring adjustment to our heart and our lives. Regarding the Old Testament, we read throughout the Old Testament, the Lord sent many prophets to instruct and correct his people. And God knows what our hearts are like, and yet he does not give up on us. And so neither should we ever give up on ourselves. Every day it's a new day and his mercies are new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to look at uh, Samuel. Let's turn back to Samuel. First Samuel chapter 7. Samuel was a prophet of God. 1 Samuel chapter 7. And he brought the word of the Lord. And verse 3. And we read here. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your heart and put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And the Philistines were an enemy to Israel. And when we follow the Lord, he will ensure we are delivered out of the hand of the enemy. Chapter 12, just read in chapter 12 and verse 20 onwards, it says here, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn you not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Natural things of this earth are vain to put our trust in. Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth, with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. But if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. So God always brings encouragement and correction. You know, and as believers, you know, we're to be taught God's good and right ways. However, when people turn away from the Lord, then they go into captivity. And if we just turn over to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 30. This is an example. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. And this is what the Lord said. He says, verse 8, Now be you not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, 
and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. But if, a, if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. God is gracious and merciful. However, the word if in the Bible sets a condition and the condition of the people coming out of captivity was if they returned to the Lord. It was their choice. And we read of a man called Josiah. Let's turn to 2 Kings. Turn back, 2 Kings, chapter 23. 2 Kings 23. And Josiah, he was a wonderful king. And he had such a sincere heart towards God. And he had a strong desire to ensure his kingdom was according to God's righteousness. And so what did he do? We read here 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 23 to 25. It says here, But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was held to the Lord in Jerusalem, moreover the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book of Hilkiah, the priest found in the throne house, found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him, there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, neither after him, after him arose any like him. What an amazing heart that he would just get rid of all the false, put it all out of the kingdom, not going to be. He so had a heart to just do it God's way and serve God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. And he was the, he was the it just said he was the most well-known king for that, serving God with all of his heart. And then we read of Nehemiah, which is a bit further over after Chronicles. Nehemiah, he was used mightily by the Lord. And Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 25 to 27, it says here, and this is the speaking of the people, they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods. They digged wells, vineyards and olives and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Right? This was God's goodness to them. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law, cast thy law behind their backs and slew your prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. Therefore, thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them and in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, you heard them from heaven and according to your manifold mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them out of the hand of the enemies. Right? They were in a terrible place at different times and God saw their situations and yet God was merciful and he sent people, saviors to deliver them out of the hands of the enemy. Why? Because they called out to the Lord. They turned again to the Lord. And, you know, God always hears a cry or the cry from a sincere heart. And just down in verse 28, reading on there, it says, But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. Many times he delivered them. He's so patient. Verse 29, And testified against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments. 
but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Withdrawing the shoulder, shoulder means to prayer. You shoulder the burden. That's how you shoulder the burden in, in God's kingdom, by prayer. We need to have a life of prayer, not just prayer meetings, but a lifestyle of prayer. And they hardened their neck. That, that was that, like that stiff neck. They just, you know, were not flexible. You know, were not flexible. They were just locked in into their own ways and they would not hear what a what a state to be in they would not hear it said they put aside god's word dreadful and verse um, 30 yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets yet they would not give ear therefore gavest them into the hand of the people of the lands Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. God's amazing, isn't he? He's so gracious. He's so merciful. He makes allowances. He knows we're dust. He knows we're made of the dust of the earth. We are but flesh, just a breath, you know. And he's so merciful. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And we read here, verse 22 onwards, it says here, this is what, this is what we're instructed here. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity and scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and you have refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regardeth. But yet you have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. You know, as believers, we need to have hearts that will respond to God's call, to God's correction. Lord, let our hearts always be soft, and our ears open to hear the knowledge, your instruction that comes only from your word. Lord, help us, O oh Lord, help us, O oh Lord. All right, next person I look at Isaiah in Isaiah 44. Isaiah was a prophet that God sent to the people. Isaiah 44, verse 21 and 22, it says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, and thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten. God calls the people his servants. We are serving God. God is not serving us. <coughs> we are serving God. And verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. You know, we truly are servants of the Most High God and we should never take God's redemption for granted. Jesus paid the price for us to come into the glorious light and we need to always value that and not just think of it as, um, as, as insignificant. Do you remember there was um, Esau and Jacob and Esau sold his birthright? He thought, oh, this is, you know, what, what good is this? I'll just let go of that. He just thought it as nothing. But we must never, ever think of our birthright. We've been born again into the kingdom of God. And with that comes much blessing and responsibility to walk the walk with God's help. And in Isaiah 55, it says here, verses 6 and 7, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon you know do we understand there will be a time when we can when the Lord can no longer be found and so God is merciful and so we need to seek him and call out to him while we have breath imagine if today was your last day imagine if this was your last moment are we up to date with the Lord? You know, we, we believe we have tomorrow, but Lord's, the Lord said, take no thought for tomorrow. 
we only have today. So we need to be treating every day as today. Hallelujah. All right, now I'd just like to turn over to Jeremiah chapter 2. We read of another one of God's great prophets named Jeremiah and whom the Lord sent to instruct God's people to turn back to him. And why does God desire people to turn back to him? Because if they do not, they will suffer the consequences of disobedience to God's standards and God's ways of righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 2, reading from verse 5, it says here, so this is the Lord speaking to the people through Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked away after vanity and become vain? Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits and through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not prophet what a dreadful situation they were really off track yeah, that's an easy way to say it and in verse 11 it says has a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit you know it was god was their deliverer it was god who provided for them it was god that kept them alive and yet they just ignored him they just turned away and went about their own lives Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We know that water speaks of the word of God. And God's word is alive and it brings us life. However, these people, instead of relying on the Lord and going to God and looking to God's word, they just made up their own ways. They just made up their own ideas, their own creation, their own plans and and of course, they came to nothing. It all leaked out. The water just leaked out. If they say, remember that saying used to be a saying, there's a hole in my bucket. It was like they're putting stuff in, trying to build things, and they were just leaking out at the other end. And I'll just read it. Um, you know, our ways can be a dead work. It says in Hebrews 6.1, I'll just read it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God. A dead work is anything not inspired by the Lord. And we don't want to get caught in that. We just want to be led of God in everything we do. Hallelujah. Not doing anything more, anything less. We just want it to be God. Hallelujah. Leading and guiding us in all things. Now, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, it says here, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that, is, that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, says the Lord God of hosts. We need to have always a sincere reverence for the Lord, and that will ensure that our lives, or that we order our lives, correctly i mean honestly just you know we understand god is god almighty and that should because he's there that should help us weigh any decisions anything we're doing any actions we're going to take the thoughts we have yielded to the lord hallelujah and chapter 3 starting verse 6 to 8 it says and the lord said unto me in the day of josiah the king hast thou seen which backsliding israel has done this is what the lord called them backsliding israel she has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree and has played the harlot and i said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not and her treacherous Ju sister judah saw it and i saw for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce 
Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. You know, we, we may not be committing natural adultery, but we can commit spiritual adultery and, and adjoining together. Adultery or fornication is adjoining together. And God wants us to join ourselves to the Lord and not be joined, not our affections, not our lust to be joined to other things. All right. Only to the Lord. And I'll just um, read it. It's in Proverbs 14, 4. It says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. So we need to be filled with God's ways and not our own ways. All right? It's a real clear indication. If our life is just all about me, 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 I, 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 we just, that should be ringing some bells. It's about God's will, God's way, and we want to be about our Father's will, just like Jesus was about his Father's will. And Jeremiah 3, verse 22, it says here, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. In chapter 4, reading from verse 1, if thou wilt return, O Israel, says the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thy abominations out of my sight, then thou shalt, then shalt thou not remove. And thou shalt swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fellow ground, and so knock among them, so not among them. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Verse 5, declare you in Judah and publish in Jerusalem. And here we go, blow you the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. A defense city is where the word of God is. It's a strong city. It's a strong, the Lord's our strong tower. But a city, we want to be in a city of truth that stands for righteousness. Hallelujah. And he's saying there, you know, break up your fellow ground. You know, we need to be making godly choices and and. And it says about um, circumcising our heart. You know, circumcising our heart. It's what happens in our heart. So we need to be cutting off because all roads lead to the heart and all things come from the heart. And so we need to be cutting off things in our lives. We make the choice of things that are not profitable, that are not fruitful, that are not drawing us towards God. We've got to lead. Yes, we're in God. We've got to lead a balanced life. Yes, we have responsibilities. But at the end of the day, if we're doing all these other things at the neglect of our relationship with the Lord, well, what's it going to be worth? And where will we spend eternity? So we need to measure and weigh all that we do with God's help. You know, we can't do it without him. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So we can't do it without the Lord. But we, as we yield our life to the Lord, he will help us make right choices, right decisions. Jeremiah chapter 5. Oh, I was just going to say then, that trumpet, as I said at the beginning, that trumpet's blowing. It's God's word. It's alive and powerful. And God's people are exhorted in that scripture to gather together and hear God's word being declared. And when we hear God's word with our spiritual ears, it will penetrate into our heart and remove from, from our heart that which is ungodly. All right, The word of God will equip us to say no to some things, to put aside some things. We will be empowered by the word and by the spirit. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, it says, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their face harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. These people refuse to receive God's correction. And they've also hardened their heart. How does that happen? By the choices they've made. And they're no longer aware of God's judgment. They're no longer aware of God's way or the judgment that's coming. 
on all ungodly and all unrighteousness. Jeremiah chapter 7. I mean, I'm reading these scriptures today because I don't know that many churches out there, it's, 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 they've got to do what they think God would have to do. But we need the word of God. We need to be hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God so that we don't get caught in some of those things that the children of Israel were. God's word is to instruct us and to correct us and to encourage and exhort us. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 7, starting from verse 23, it says, But this thing commanded I to them, this is the Lord saying, Obey my voice and I will be your God. What's God's voice? It's his word. And I'll be your God. And you shall be my people and walk in all the ways that I've commanded you, that it may be well with you. When we walk in God's ways, things will go well. We might go through trials and testings, but it will all work together for good. Verse 24, but they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Since the day of your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. When you think about Jeremiah, Jeremiah is trying to declare God's word and God's saying, Jeremiah, they're not going to listen to you. And he's, you know, he's still declaring God's word and God's saying, Jeremiah, they're not going to listen to you. And you know, we have a saying that if people can't hear the Holy Spirit, they're not going to hear you. If people haven't got a heart to hear God's word, no matter what you say. So God sends his word. It's his word that brings the adjustment in our lives. And we need God's word to do that. And, um, but these people were in such a predicament. And if we harden our heart to God's word and do not receive God's correction, trust me, life is just going to get worse because that's exactly what happened to the children of Israel. And they are an example to us. And uh, just, uh, we're going to come back to Jeremiah, but just let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And verse 11 and 12, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delights. The word chastening means warning. It means correction. It means discipline. It means instruction and rebuke. That's what God is doing with us. And the word correction, it, um, it says there, and not be weary of his correction. Correction means rebuke or reproof. The Amplified says, My son, do not despise or shrink from the chastening of the Lord. His correction by punishment or by subjection to suffer or trial. Neither be weary of an impatient, sorry, neither be weary or impatient about or loathe or abhor his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. You know, because he loves us and he delights in us, his people. He brings correction. He brings discipline. He brings instruction. He brings rebuke and reproof to our lives. Amen. We need that. If there's things in our heart, Lord, please bring the adjustment to my heart through your word that I might be more like you. Hallelujah. And to remove those things that, need, that are unfruitful, are vain, out of my heart, Lord. All right, let's just turn back to Jeremiah. He was a mighty man, Jeremiah. He just kept preaching. I was thinking too, you know, um, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And I think in building the ark, it was a hundred years. And he just kept preaching the word of God, just declaring the word of God, declaring the word of God. And at the day when the flood came, were there many people there in the ark? No, 
No. And so, you know, that's an example. And so, that, you know, clearly many people are not hearing God's word. And but, you know, Noah just kept preaching. At least Jeremiah was told by the Lord, they're not going to hear you. They're not going to hear you. They're not they're just going to refuse you because Jeremiah, they're refusing me. So they're going to refuse you, too. So don't take it to heart, Jeremiah. And pastors, don't take it to heart if people aren't hearing the word of righteousness. If they're not hearing, don't take it to heart. Jeremiah, all these prophets are telling God's people God's ways, God instructing them in righteousness and the people are withdrawing and going another way and doing whatever they would believe God would have them to do. If it's God leading, wonderful. If it's them just pulling back and just um, turning aside to things that are vain, uh, God is merciful and he'll still keep trying to turn people back to himself. Hallelujah. And do we read verse um, Jeremiah chapter 8? We read 5 and 6, did we? Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. It says, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They did hold fast this seat. They refused to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into a battle. They're just trying to say, I haven't done anything. Well, I'm sorry. It's the word of God that brings conviction and instruction and says this is God's standards and these are our standards or what's in our heart. And it, we fall far short. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we need to be saved. And once we are saved, we are to bring forth fruits of righteousness, according to John the Baptist. All right, John, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 5 to 7, it says here, For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem, or who shall bemoan thee, or who shall go aside to ask how you're doing? Thou hast forsaken me, says the Lord. Thou art gone backward, therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. I mean, that's an ultimate judgment, isn't it? You know, and you know, they, it's God saying they have, fors you know, the people have forsaken him. I mean, we don't want the Lord to forsake us, do we? Ever. We don't want him to forsake us. And there is a promise he said, I'll never leave or forsake you. And yet if we just... Leave off, leave off, stay away, do not return. Eventually, there will be eternal consequences. So how serious is this? And the children of Israel are an example to us. So what about us as believers? Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And we read here, starting in verse 1. Therefore thou art, and so, yeah, because, you know, when you point the finger, oh, look at this, look at this, look at that. Did you know there's three fingers pointing back? <laughs> you know, we can't point the finger at others. It's God who puts his word out there to reveal hearts. All right. So it's not for us to reveal hearts. We just let God's word do it. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. Therefore thou art excusable, O man, whoever thou that judges. For when thou judgest another, thou condemns thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. We're all made of the same stuff. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest this, thou this, O man, that judgest them that do such things, and doest the same, and thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up thou unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. It's the goodness of God to lead us to repentance because there's a judgment coming. But if we don't, he, God's going to render to every man according to his deeds. So if one does not repent, ultimately 
they will receive the judgment of God. Let's just go back to Jeremiah 25. I didn't count the pages, but Jeremiah has a lot to say, doesn't he? And how merciful is God? He just keeps coming at them. He just keeps coming again. He's so um, patient and persistent, isn't he, the Lord? 25, chapter 25, verses 4 onwards, it says here, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn you again, now every one from his evil ways and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. You know, as believers, you know, do we have ears to hear, spiritual ears to hear God's word? And then we read a similar passage, Jeremiah chapter 35 and verse 15. It says here, I mean, God just gives it, doesn't just do it once, does he? Just ongoing. Verse 15, I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early. That's what he just said back in Jeremiah 25. Rising up early, sending the prophets, sending them, saying, return you now everyone from his evil way and amend your doings and go not after other gods to serve them and you shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But you have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. And if we just turn over to the next book, which is Lamentations. And Lamentations was also written by Jeremiah. And to lament, you know, it's not a word we use, is it? Lament is to have a passionate expression of grief. And Jeremiah, he was lamenting, grieving over the disobedience of the people of God. And he kept just declaring God's attributes and lamentations chapter 3 verse 19 it says here remember mine affliction he's saying this to the lord remember mine affliction and my misery the wormwood and the gall my soul has them still in remembrance and is humbled in me this i recall to my mind therefore have i hope it is of the lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning and great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says, the, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. Hallelujah. And verse 40, it says, let us search and try our ways and turn again unto the Lord. So now is the time to turn away from other things and turn or return to the Lord. Amen. If we just go over to the next chapter, uh, Ezekiel. He was also a prophet, Ezekiel chapter 14. God just kept sending these prophets. It just... Amazing. Ezekiel 14, just reading from verse 1, it says, And then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of God came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols." Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols 
and turn away your faces from all your abominations. I'll just read verse 7. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face that comes to a prophet to inquire of him, the Lord will answer him. I, the Lord, will answer him myself. You know, an idol, what's an idol? It's when we give something a preeminence or excessive devotion to rather than to God. We're meant to give our heart, our attention, our affections to God. And so an idol is something that comes before God. And this scripture says that these idols were in their heart. So it wasn't just things made of hands or stone or wood and so forth or other distractions of the age that we're now in. These were coming from their heart. And as I said at the beginning, all things come from the heart. And then verse 8, it says, And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord God. God, there's no ambiguity with God, is there? He just says it straight, really plain. Uh, you don't have to have a university degree to understand God's ways. He just says it quite plainly. All we have to do is read his word, which is his voice to us. At chapter 33 and verse 11, and it says here, Say unto them, so the Lord saying to Ezekiel, Say to the people, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Right? Turn ye, turn ye. God gives it twice. He's imploring them just to, will you just turn? And uh, if we just turn to Second Peter, Second Peter. God hasn't changed. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says here, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the Amplified says, The Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness, but he is long-suffering extraordinarily patient toward you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. That's God's heart. He is love. He is love, but he's a God of justice and he's not going to have sin in heaven. No, anything that's not measuring up to God needs to be repented of. And if we just turn back to Hosea, that was after, after Daniel, after and Hosea he was also a prophet sent by God and Hosea chapter 14 and verse 1 and 2 it says O Israel return unto the Lord your God for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity iniquity is our own will it's our willfulness willfulness and our own will, our strong will, our flesh will take us away from God. Verse 2, take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, take away all iniquity. This is what we're to pray. Lord, take away all my iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. So we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and we have to call out to him. The Amplified says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled and fallen visited by calamity due to your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all our iniquity. Accept what is good and receive us graciously. So will we render our thanks as, as bullocks to be sacrificed and pay the confession of our lips. Hallelujah. Turning to the Lord. And then the next book is Joel. And we just read Joel chapter 2. We read verse 1 before. I'll put it now. It's, uh, verse 1 says, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy hill. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble 
for the day of the Lord cometh for its night hand. He's coming back right on time and we need to be ready and we need to be getting ourselves ready with his help. Hallelujah. And in verse um, 10 to 13, it says here, this is what's going to happen. We're in the end times. And it says here, therefore, also now says the Lord, turn ye every one to me with all your heart and with fastings and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's merciful. He's merciful. And gracious, he's slow to anger. Did we read that verse 13? Hallelujah. 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 He's amazing. He's amazing. And then just uh, Zechariah, second last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 1. Another prophet God sent to the people. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 3. Therefore say unto them, Zechariah, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn you unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. And in verse four, be you not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn you now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearkened unto me, says the Lord. You know, the children of Israel, and we need to be like them, we need to turn to the Lord and to hearken to God's word of instruction. I mean, how many times, I mean, it says in the mouth of two or three, everything's established. Well, I don't know how many scriptures I'm giving here today, but it's a lot, all right? And it's here, God's just saying it, the same thing in book after book, prophet after prophet. All right, now we know that in the Old Testament, God used prophets, but in the New Testament, God uses his ministries to instruct and correct his people. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And this is the Lord, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has his ministries in the body, bringing his word of righteousness. And if we turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, because chapter 11 was all about the people of faith. I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. I'm just reading about those that were choosing that. All right, but in Hebrews 11, they were all people of faith and what God, what God did through people who would look to him, trust him, do it his way. And then we read verse 12. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. The sin, I believe that's unbelief. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I believe uh, people doing it God's way is the joy that God would have, and also it's the bride that he's preparing in earth, his glorious church. That's what was on his heart. What God was going to do in these end times, it's going to be for God's glory, and God's doing it. And he just wants people from their heart to love him, serve him, and desire him. And so now is not the time to turn away from God, but rather we need to put other things aside and press into God. Hallelujah. Look, time is short. Jesus is coming back right on time. We're closer now than we've ever been. We really are. Look at the signs in the world. Just as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall be the coming of the Son of God. Like we are nearly there. And so we are nearly there. And yet none of us know our last day. So it behoves us that we all be up to date with the Lord this day. Hallelujah. And verse 5 and 7, it says, 
and have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Lord chastens not? That word chasteneth there, it means to train, discipline, instruct, and teach. Just like we read in Proverbs. Let's read on verse 8. It says, But if you be without chastisement, that's instruction and uh, discipline and training and being taught, if you be without all of that, wherefore are you partakers? Then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall not we much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. So God's correction through his word, by his Holy Spirit and through his ministries, it's going to produce God's fruit of righteousness in us, in our hearts. Hallelujah. All that other, anything else will just drop off. Hallelujah. We won't have time for that anymore. We'll just know that the things of God are far more important. So if we've turned away from the Lord in any capacity, what should we do? Number one is humble ourselves. So let's turn to Second Chronicles, chapter 7. Kings Chronicles, chapter 7. And we read here, and verse 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The Amplified says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. We have to humble ourselves. God doesn't humble us. It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. If we will humble ourselves, pray, seek, crave, and require of necessity my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. You know, we, we might be thinking, oh, you know, we, we might have wicked ways. We're not aware of wicked ways. But the scripture says all unrighteousness and sin is sin. So anything in our heart and our life that doesn't measure up to the word of God, it's sin. And so for all of us, we need to always be humble before God and seeking God. And, you know, we are made of the dust of the earth. So we want the Lord to heal our land. Our land. Our land needs healing. It needs fortifying. It needs all God's word to be produced in our life and in our heart. And so, you know, we sometimes just need to be honest with ourselves and just humble ourselves and turn from our own ways and turn to the Lord and just seek God. Just turn off the television or turn off the social media or go and find a place on your own, at your bottom of your bed, on your knees, wherever. Find that place where you can be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. It's about a relationship. And if you've ever seen a couple that are in love, they just want to be together all the time. They, they want to meet for coffee. They want to meet for meals. They want to go out together. They want to walk together. They want to do... Is that how it is with us? Because we're meant to be in love with the Lord. He wants us to love him more than we would love others. He wants to be first. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Hallelujah. So we just need to keep seeking the Lord, humble ourselves and seek the Lord. Number two, we need to repent and call out to God for his mercy. Let's just turn to Psalm 80. Psalm 80 
verse 3, it says, Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine. Verse 7, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And verse 19, Turn us again, O Lord, God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Again, when we call out to the Lord for his mercy and help, and when we do, we will be saved. Hallelujah. And we read a warning. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9. And we read here. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Amplified says, now, however that now, however that you have come to be acquainted and understand and know the true God, or rather to be understood and known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly and worthless elementary things of the religions before Christ came, whose slaves you once more want to become? We don't want to, in, in any capacity, not just religious things, in any capacity, we don't want to turn back to our old ways. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, we're exhorted, says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And the Amplified says, In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then, and do not be hampered and ensnared, and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you've once put off. Like, we don't want to go back to our old ways. We repented of our old, our old ways so we can walk the walk in God. There's nothing back there. There's no life back there. There's nothing there that we should desire. We don't want to be like the children of Israel who desire the leeks and the garlics. They had a terrible time in Egypt. But the enemy can be so subtle, he can turn it around and say, well, do you remember how it used to be in the old days? Do you remember how it used to be back there before you got saved? Do you remember? It's rubbish. We got saved because that was rubbish back there. It was sin. And so we let go of it. We turned to God, repented and started walking the walk. We don't, there's nothing to go back to. You put the line in the sand. We are water baptized. We are cleansed. It's a new beginning. It's a walk. And we stay walking with God, with God's help. Hallelujah. And number three, Tithe to the Lord. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 14. All scripture is profitable. And Abraham is the father of all who believe. And at the time of receiving bread and wine, which speaks of communion from Melchizedek, Abraham gave tithes at all. So tithing was done before the law. And we read it in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thy enemies into the hand. And he, Abram, gave him tithes of all. So communion and tithes go together. That's the pattern. Communion and tithes go together and churches many churches are quite willing to take the tithes but churches all churches need to provide communion at the same time because jesus sorry abraham is the father of all who believe and god had, had uh, exhorted him and and said that he knew that abraham would train his children well abraham natural children but we are the spiritual seed of abraham through jesus christ so tithing continued through the law period. And let's turn to Malachi chapter 3. Last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. Reading from verse 6. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I'll return unto you, says the Lord. But you said, we're in hell. How can we return? Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, 
wherein have we robbed thee? And this is the Lord's answer, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me this whole nation. So how were they instructed to turn, return to the Lord? In tithes and offerings. So it's not just offerings, it's tithes and offerings. Verse 10, the Lord says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that's the church, that there may be meat in my house, meets the word of God in my house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall, shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. When they ordered their lives according to God's word, they were blessed. You know, I know, uh, just came to me then, I know of a person, and they were in church for a time, and they were very generous in offerings, but they did not get hold of the power of tithes or even walking in obedience towards tithes. And it says when we tithe, God rebukes the devourer. And this person to this day is still being, and they eventually just walked away, walked away from God. And to this day, their life is still being devoured, absolutely devoured. The enemy is running rampant over their life. And, you know, and I do do every so often, as the Lord promised me, I do uphold this person. God won't force anybody to walk in his ways. God just keeps saying, return to me, return to me. But that, you know, that one I just learned so very easily. And I, I just watched, and over the years, I've watched people that have unusual situations, just real, it's not just the, um, in their walk, they really uh, struggle and they really get terribly afflicted. I mean, we know there's oppression. We know there's affliction. We know there's spiritual opposition. That's one thing. But people who aren't tithing, I have seen them absolutely devoured by the enemy. They almost look like the unsaved. It is dreadful because tithing puts it in a sand in the a line in the sand. And God's saying, they belong to me because they've returned to me. Because money, I tell you, money it's the love of money that's the problem. Money's not a problem. Money can be used for good things, but it's the love of money. And so somewhere you've got to make sure in your heart that there's not a pocket where the enemy can just um, manipulate you concerning money. And while I'm on it, everything comes from God. God gives us the money. God gives you the job. God gives you the health. You know, if we weren't healthy and uh, so forth, we would be spending a whole lot of money in the hospital system. But God blesses us when we walk in his ways. He rebukes the devour. He rebukes the sickness. He rebukes all those other things that the enemy wants to send our way. But tithing and offerings puts a line in the sand. And I'm just saying that because that is my observation over the years. And uh, I hope that it's helpful to some because it's just truth. And uh, I'll just say, look, it's just come to me too. I knew a man and um, he used to work for a, a company where the, the man who owned the company, all right, so you've got the owner of the company and my friend, right, his name was Jeff. And Jeff used to work with this man, right? And this man said to Jeff, you know, what are you doing this weekend? And Jeff said, oh, I'm going to church. He, he was quite okay about saying I'm going to church. He was bold. And this man, the owner said, oh, churches just want your money, just want your money. And Jeff said, no, you don't understand. There's a scripture that says, prove me now, it says, it says, God says, prove me now and I'll pour you out a blessing. And, um, and Jeff said that tithing works. And this man, now he's not a believer, okay? He says to Jeff, really? God says we can prove him. And Jeff says, yes. And so this man says, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. Every week, I will give you the profit from the business. And, uh, and Jeff explained a tithe was a tenth. I will give you a tenth. And you can take it to your church and you can give it to your church. And um, of course, we give our tithe to the Lord, but it's used through the church. And, uh, and we'll just see. And, and Jeff said, fine. So every week, every Friday night, this man would give Jeff the tithe from the business and Jeff would take it to the church on the Sunday. Well, I think it was like three months went past. And this was happening every Friday night. So three months is a fair time, isn't it? Anyway, the manager called Jeff into his office 
And uh, so Jeff thinks, oh, you know, is he in trouble? Has he done something wrong? What's, you know, boss has called him in. And he says, sit down, Jeff. And Jeff thought, oh, it's really serious. I've got to sit down. And, and the manager absolutely, he shows him the results, the financial results for the last three months. And he said, Jeff, our profits for our company have absolutely gone up like no other quarter. And he said, I've done no advertising, no marketing, nothing different. But the only thing I did different was give tithes. And the manager says, this tithing thing really works. He said, can I come to your church? And the man got saved through tithing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, I think that's a terrific testimony. And I know Jeff and it's, it's amazing. And so he says there in that scripture, verse 10, prove me now. Is it? Just uh, verse 10. Bring all the tithes of the storehouse that they may meet in my house and prove me now, says the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. So hallelujah. Actually, I know of somebody else who said, um, who actually, they actually came to us and they said, um, oh, they were really struggling with their money. They weren't in church, but they were struggling, and they were struggling with their money. All right, so there's two problems. <laughs> but anyway, um, we just said to them, well, you need to tithe. You need to be in church, but you need to tithe as well. Anyway, and, the, and, and, and actually we said, um, and if the tithing doesn't work, we'll make up the gap for you. All right, can't, we not, can't lose on that deal, can you? Anyway, so the person started tithing. And what happened? There was money in their bank account. People started giving money. It just arrived in their bank. Things started happening. Things turned around. Why? Because it's God's word. And when we obey God's word, God stands behind his word to perform it. Hallelujah. And so that was a real evidence to that person that God honors tithers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So going back to um, Melchizedek, according to scripture, you know, Jesus, he's our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we today are priests after that same order of Melchizedek. And we're to honor the Lord with our tithes on all increase. And Proverbs chapter 3, I'll read it. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. It says here, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And I'll read verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And the Amplified says, Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors and with the first fruits of all your income. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats will be overflowing with new wine. When we tithe, just so we have it clear, we tithe on all increase. If someone gives you a gift, you value the gift and you pay, the first, you pay 10% of that gift, giving it to the Lord. If you have a job, you have a gross amount and a net amount, you pay the tithe, give the tithe on the gross amount. Right, because it's from the gross amount that the taxes go out, the gross amount that the tithes goes out. Because Jesus said, render unto Caesar what's Caesar's and render unto God what's God's. The tithe belongs to God. If you are spending it, that scripture said in Malachi, you're robbing God. I'm not saying it, that scripture said it. So when we tithe on all increase, we are honoring the Lord and we are acknowledging to him that all increase has come from him. Amen. All right, so we've done one, two, three. And number four is make straight paths. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter five. Deuteronomy chapter five. And verse 32 and 33. And it says here, You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Hallelujah. Walk in the ways of God. Now let's just quickly turn back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. It says here, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. All right. 
Making straight paths is a choice. So we must not allow ourselves, with God's help, to be distracted by other things, trying to get our attention or turning us away either to the right hand or to the left. And the Amplified says, So then brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feeble and palsied and tottering knees and cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet. Yes, make them safe and upright and happy paths that go in the right direction so that the lame and halting limbs may not be put out of joint, but rather may be cured. Hallelujah. Our paths need to be straight and fixed. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs 4. And verse, reading from verse 10, it says here, Hear, O my son, and, re and, and daughters, of course, hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. That's what we just read in Hebrews, wasn't it? Right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou run, you shall not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. It's a choice, all right? Enter not. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done some mischief, and their sleep is taken away, except they cause some to fall. We don't want to go in the path of the wicked and we don't want to stumble and fall with God's help. And verse 20, just reading on from verse 20, it says, My son, son, attend unto my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to them that find them and health to all thy flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You know, Jesus said, Follow me and our paths, our feet, we need to be walking the walk, the ways, our, we, our paths need to be following the ways of Jesus. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9. Nine verse 51. And it says here, And it came to pass, and speaking of Jesus, and it came to pass when the time was come that he, Jesus, should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And in Luke 13, verse 22, it says, and speaking of Jesus, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards, toward Jerusalem. What was Jesus doing? He was teaching God's word and ways in various cities and villages. And that's what I'm doing through this topic. I'm teaching about us turning again to the Lord. Hallelujah. And where was Jesus going? Jesus was journeying towards Jerusalem. And as believers, we are pilgrims in this life and are journeying towards spiritual Jerusalem, the city of God. Hallelujah. And we're almost there. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 11, we read another warning. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16 and 17, it says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up heaven and there be no rain that, and that the land yield not her fruit and let, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Rain speaks of the word of God. And if we've turned aside to other things, 
we will not be in a place to receive the word of God. And if we do not receive the rain, the word of God, there will be no fruit on our branch. And John 15 says that if there's no fruit on the branch, we'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. So John 15, 5 to 6, uh, I'll turn to it. John 15, last scripture. John 15, John 15, 5 and 6, it says here, Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, all right? So we are all branches. He that abides in me and I in him, abiding means remain, it means continue. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So from the many examples that we've reviewed in this topic, we've learned how very patient and merciful the Lord is and how many times he sent his ministries, his prophets to encourage, exhort and instruct his people to turn again to him. So in summary, we only have today. And if we know that we're not in the place with the Lord that we should be, now's the time to repent and turn again to the Lord and receive his mercy. And everyone said, Amen.